Hello everyone! In today's presentation, we're going to consider a very interesting, yet mysterious type of rock. You can find it on the surface of all the world's continents, but it originally formed deep underground. It came from magma, the substance made when solid rocks are melted. It's called a plutonic rock. Let's explore exactly what this is, how it is formed, and why it matters. When we talk about plutonic rocks, it's helpful to compare them with volcanic rocks, which I have already covered in a separate video. Both of these are formed by the cooling of magma into a crystalline solid. The key difference is where they form. Volcanic rocks are only produced on the Earth's surface, when they are exposed to the air of the atmosphere or the water of the ocean. They come from magma that has escaped the Earth's crust, lava. Plutonic rocks come from magma that is trapped inside the crust. While they form, they are surrounded not by atmosphere, but by stone. At depth, conditions such as temperature and pressure are very different from those on the surface, and these conditions affect how the magma cools and crystallizes. For one thing, it cools down very slowly. When volcanic rocks are produced, they cool down rapidly because the temperature contrast between lava and air is very sharp. The minerals inside these rocks don't have much time to clump together and grow into crystals, so the crystals we do observe in volcanic rocks are usually tiny. By contrast, magma under the ground cools over a longer period of time. This means the minerals that crystallize from it have plenty of time to clump together. Individual crystals in the resulting rock are larger as a result. In most plutonic rocks, they can be seen with the naked eye. Here is a piece of granite. You can clearly see individual interlocking crystals and categorize them based on their color. Each color represents a different mineral. The whitish mineral is quartz, the pink one is potassium rich feldspar, and the shiny black one is mica. Big crystals make mineral identification a lot easier. Unlike most rocks, pegmatite is classified based on the size of its crystals, not its chemical makeup. Individual crystals are over 2.5 cm across, and often grow larger than that. One pegmatite in Madagascar contains the largest confirmed crystal ever found in nature. It's made of the mineral beryl, and it's 18 meters long, three times the height of a giraffe. When we do consider the chemical makeup of these rocks, we find they can be classified in a similar way to volcanic rocks. In both cases, there is a spectrum with a felsic composition at one end and a mafic composition at the other. Felsic is short for feldspar silica. It refers to rocks containing a high proportion of feldspar and quartz. Mafic is short for magnesium iron. It applies to rocks which contain olivine, pyroxene, or mica, minerals rich in those particular elements. I already mentioned granite, which is a felsic plutonic rock. This is the rock that supports much of the Earth's continental crust. Huge amounts of it are now exposed in the Sierra Nevada of North America, where these spectacular photos were taken. Granite shares the high durability of the quartz crystals within it. It erodes more slowly than other rock types in the landscape, so it stands out in places where erosion has brought it to the surface. Let's place it at this end of the spectrum. At the other end we find a rock called gabbro. This one tends to be darkly coloured and very dense. It's the equivalent of basalt and it underlies much of the world's oceanic crust. In between is diorite, a plutonic rock that is said to have an intermediate composition. It's the equivalent of the volcanic rock andesite, and sure enough, large volumes of this stuff are thought to lie beneath the Andes Mountains. We also see here the full range of pegmatite compositions. They can be felsic, mafic, or intermediate, depending on the minerals contained in the magma that produces them. 
There are also rocks that lie at the extreme ends of the spectrum. Ultramafic rocks contain little to no felsic minerals. Instead, the most common ones are dominated by olivine, which is bright green and very dense. Such rocks are collectively called peridotite. They make up the rocky mantle of the earth, its thickest layer. Ultrafelsic rocks are also known to exist, but they are hard to come by on earth. Anorthosite is one of them. It's packed full of feldspar crystals. Bodies of anorthosite on earth are found in the cores of continents, and most of them are over 1 billion years old. Curiously, this rock is plentiful on the moon. It covers the pale portions of the lunar highlands, surrounding darker patches of basalt. For the rest of this video, let's consider the more common plutonic rocks, and investigate the unique formations they produce. As I said before, the magma they crystallize from is initially molten. Being less dense than the solid rocks surrounding it, the magma rises up through the Earth's crust, forcing its way through cracks and crevices. The overall magma body is known as a pluton. Anywhere it becomes trapped, plutonic rocks may form. Here, for example, molten rock has collected in a magma chamber, which feeds an erupting volcano. When the volcano quietens down and becomes inactive, all the leftover magma will gradually solidify. Dome-shaped plutons like this are commonly found in places where volcanoes used to stand, but have since been eroded down. Here some magma has forced its way into a vertical crack. It will cool and crystallize to form a dike, a sheet of plutonic rock that cuts across the pre-existing rock layers. When magma collects inside a horizontal crack, it forms a sill by the same process. Dikes and sills create interesting checkered patterns in places like the Antarctic Peninsula, where they manifest as black stripes slicing through the ancient bedrock. Plutons can be isolated blobs, or they may rise up in long chains, for example along a subduction zone. Some of them are absolutely massive, there is a special class of pluton that covers at least 100 square kilometers of surface area. It's called a batholith. There are a few batholiths around the world. We observe them in the cores of certain mountain chains, including the Sierra Nevada. This means that, even when we can't see them, plutonic rocks have a crucial role in shaping continental landscapes. Time for a summary. You should now be able to define a plutonic rock in your own words, and name some common examples. You should be comfortable comparing plutonic and volcanic rocks in terms of how and where they form. It would also be helpful to know what the terms felsic and mafic refer to. Finally, you should be able to name and describe some key plutonic formations, especially magma chambers, dikes, sills, and batholiths. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you did, feel free to like the video and leave any questions in the comments below. There will be more like this on the way soon, so please subscribe to my channel if you don't want to miss out. That's all for today, so thank you for watching and good luck with school!